1947, TV news had very few rules, and the format was, well, whatever worked. But then a young USC graduate came on the scene at a station called KTLA Los Angeles. I got a call asking me if I would uh, like to go to work at KTLA. I was just overwhelmed, and I said, sure, it's a dollar and a quarter an hour and time and a half for overtime. And uh, it was such an adventure that I really don't remember too many details. I was so excited about going on. And In the early days of local broadcasting, glamour hadn't been invented yet. The uh, studio was an old garage right opposite Paramount Pictures. Paramount Pictures owned the studio, and this was where they had their television operation. And we didn't have offices. What we did is we had curtains, floor to ceiling curtains on four sides, and that was your office. I don't even remember what I did, but usually it was a newscast. You know, you'd go to the teletype machine and you'd rip off the wire copy and you'd bring it in, you'd sit down and you would read three minutes of news. That was our news program. So I got to start doing news very early because of that. As you can see, we're here in our new news control. Our broadcast moving to 5.30 now. The reason we've moved here is in order that we can bring to you late developments as they take place. Tonight, KTLA inaugurates a new concept in sports coverage. The players themselves, the professionals who play the games, will be here at our sports desk. Tonight, but in between my newscasts, I was moving props and moving sets and carrying gear over to Paramount wardrobe and Paramount uh, studio uh, uh, storage areas where we would bring a lot of our props in. So I we carry the props in for the show that night. And to get a good picture, it had to be very, very hot, meaning the light's very close to you. So when you went on, you had this huge uh, garage, lights completely circling the, the front of the stage, and you did your broadcast that way. All live, all very primitive, and all very exciting, because people at home were just looking at something moving. Can you imagine? This is television. Look at that. Look at his hat. Looking at this point to further uh, protect the actual area. In the early days, reporters played a lot of different roles. For Stan Chambers, it was being the sidekick on, of all things, a local cooking show. I was there throughout the half hour broadcast once a week, and my main job was to say, mm, mm, isn't that good? Tuesday night, and time for KTLA's home economist, chorus guy in tricks and treats. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you again tonight. Um, oh, Sam, what are you doing? Oh, Christ, come here. Look at Joe. What's he doing? <laughs> Looks like he's farming or something. You've got to uh, look at that. About, well, I guess about a three by four plot or something. Well, it can't be any bigger than that, really. Yeah. <laughs> Poor old Joe. Oh, there is it too big. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Hi, Joe. <laughs> I imagine that's about a three by four plot of ground or something, and he has some much. But it's very ambitious. <clears throat> Hope he keeps busy. What have we got here, Chorus? Well, you know, Stan, I don't usually do any comparative testing of foods. I know you don't. Well, but... tonight I'd like to have you try, though, two different cups of coffee. Well, that's fair enough. This is something new, though. Mm -hmm. This is marked A, for your benefit. A. Uh-huh. What do you want? Oh, I know. Oh, I know. Now, let's see. You want me to tell which is the MJB? Uh-huh, that's right. Well? I want to see if you can tell. Mmm, that's good. We used to do big live entertainment programs because we didn't have videotape. We had to have a big show every night to fill up an hour. So for years, I did an ice show, Frosty Frolics. So comedy on ice. What an opportunity for young men. Mediocre appearance will do. No salary, but free tourist class accommodations for France. Oh, boy, it's a real chance. Paris, here I come. You can keep the Empire State is very tall, but that's not all. I know you've been waiting. 
you, you, you play. I was a waiter in one show, and I was an MC in another. And I, you know, and it, it was it wasn't scripted really. It was okay. Then we go to you, and you do something, and then you come to me, and then I will do something. We present subjects from your vast empire, from many of the great nations of the world, in this command performance. First, from the land of Scotland. Some of their native dances, some of their most It was dances. live television that made Stan Chambers presented. the broadcast professional he is today. No matter what went wrong, you still had to talk. Incidentally, speaking of last minute, you know we're having a big wedding up at the hotel today. The whole village is... And it, it was those, those challenging moments that uh, were just intoxicating. You, you thoroughly enjoyed the pressure. You thoroughly enjoyed the whole atmosphere, the, the, the dangers, the challenges, and the fact is that you're standing there and maybe the words didn't come out, but there's no excuse, you were on the air. The, the big thing to learn is you don't let your face tell what you're feeling if you're wrong, because you get in too deep, it, it's hard to get out. So you at least make believe whatever you're doing or talking about is what you really wanted to do. Give me a four-letter word starting with B and ending with T. Three. You've got 100 points. Give me a three-letter word starting with T and ending with E. Three. You've got 200 points. Give me a four-letter word starting with O and ending with S. Oh. You've got 300 points on your game our game. And now to play you more about it. Thank you, Stan Sabres. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Beat the Odds, wherein two contestants vie against each other and the law of averages. Stan, how about reintroducing our contestants tonight? Mike, tonight's the first time we've had our contestants come back. They were all tied up last night with 900 points each. First from Anaheim, a project engineer of infrared detection system, Arnold Parks. From Englewood, a homemaker and former executive secretary, Mildred Boyle. Klaus Landsberg, manager of KTLA, could be called the Renaissance man of television and is probably the person whose career captures most accurately the pioneering spirit of the early days of television. Although his main focus was on electronic developments and television transmission, he ran the programming site as well. Less than a month after the station became commercial, there was a tremendous explosion in downtown Los Angeles. A huge blast at an electroplating company on Pico Boulevard leveled many buildings. Landsberg managed to get his large, bulky cameras out of the studio, onto a truck, and set up a signal from the explosion site. The cameras showed the devastation. Landsberg showed his understanding of his audience in 1949 when he dispatched a live television crew to the scene of a dramatic rescue attempt. His decision charted the course the television news would follow. The weekend time stood still. In April 1949, I was the MC of a luncheon at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. I spoke to about a thousand women of B'nai B'rith at the annual celebration in the elegant ballroom. I'd given my speech and had just introduced the featured entertainer for the affair. Then the phone began to ring. I watched the head waiter pick up the phone, put the receiver on his table and start walking in my direction. He stopped right behind me and said, it's for you. It was my mother. Have you heard about the little girl who fell in the well? The station is sending a remote crew there to televise it. You're to meet them there as soon as possible. It's a huge open field. A lot of people around, a lot of equipment around, a lot of, of, of just, I would say, chaos, you know, movement one way or the other. The actual rescue effort was just the center of this big hole that they had dug originally to try to to uh, get down to the well. So he had a big ring, almost like a volcano. And around the ring were various pieces of equipment, big, huge earth moving equipment, drilling equipment. Uh, the, the studios had sent motion picture lights there so they would illuminate the evening while they were working. 
uh, people were coming up with everything that they might need. There was a talk of a while they needed some, a parachute, so the doctor could go down and a parachute showed up in, in a half an hour. Uh, the people were that close to what was going on. Then there was a long screen. It just happened it was a fencing. And there are thousands. I, it's hard to know how many. Some people say as many as 5,000. I, I don't know. I can't remember. But many, many people were there just standing, watching what was going on. It was a very reverent crowd, a very quiet crowd, a very somber crowd. And they were standing there uh, watching as this happened. And then when, the, uh, when these men would come up after being down there for an hour or so, tremendous ovation from the crowd that here was, here was a person who had given it his all to try to rescue the little girl. And they, they moved with that and they were really, really a part of that. And uh, the churches, all the churches had prayers for Kathy the next day. So the whole city was just thoroughly involved. And then when the word came out that she was dead, it was just like a tremendous personal blow to each and every person. Here was everyone's little girl, and we just lost her. And uh, the city felt that. And to this day, I will meet the half a dozen people who will say I remember the Kathy Piscus telecast. Bill walked me back to the excavation. They started working last night digging the hole. It got deeper and deeper. The sides began to slide and dirt kept pouring down on the guys working at the bottom. There's no shoring or anything to protect the men down there. He pointed to the well casing in the center. Little Kathy is stuck somewhere inside of that. Cameraman Eddie Resnick waved us back to the truck. Klaus stood with one foot on the running board and called out, We're all ready. Bill and I stopped next to the television transmitting unit. Klaus jumped up into the truck and sat in the makeshift director's chair in front of control panels with its television monitors. They tried digging that big hole to get to her. That didn't work. They're trying to cut open a window in the side of the well pipe to see if they can spot the little girl. After that, they're going to stop digging. I'll have these monitors in front of me to see what's going on, and I'll tell you over the earphones what the camera's showing, and you just describe it. Bill and I went on the air about the time O.A. Kelly finished cutting into the well pipe with his blowtorch. He was able to peer through the window and look down into the dark well below. He yelled to the workers on top, I think I can see something that looks like a dress, but it's too far down there to be certain. But that's about it. I can't see the little girl. The sides of the huge opening kept on slipping. Dirt was pouring down in steady streams, and Kelly kept on working. Faced with the probability of a major cave-in, the plan to reach Kathy through the side of the pipe was abandoned. And again, here's Klaus again. We are at a certain location. He has three cameras, and he can see different things. So he'll tell us what he is shooting, and he'll even give you some words that you should say. So he's into the into the reporting part of it, as well as the directing part of it. It's, it's just the whole thing. How did you get information? Through Klaus, through the public information officers, we had a lot of them. They, uh, everybody was willing to talk. And so what would happen is when Bill would be, t would be on the air, I would be going around talking to a group that's going down next or a group that just came up. Maybe I'd bring one of them over for an interview. I remember saying over and over, Kathy's mother heard her crying in the well right after she fell in. Her rescuers believed that she was unconscious, oblivious to what was going on. When we saw Raymond Hill, an engineer and a close friend of the Fiscus family, coming in to take charge of the rescue operation, there was a flurry of activity. A huge earth drilling machine dug a new deep hole, its corkscrew drill burrowing deep into the ground, pulling up layers of loose dirt depositing it on the surface, then the huge casing was driven into the earth. I recall standing in the dust and dirt, feeling the ground rumble and listening to one of the engineers outlining the plan. We're going to hammer that casing about 100 feet into the ground to a point below where Kathy is trapped. We have to get all of the dirt inside out of that casing and then go down to the bottom and cut a vertical tunnel across, shored up with timbers, try to dig across to the well pipe where we can get her. It was a brave and dangerous plan, but it meant that it would be a long time before they could reach Kathy. I broadcast for hours as the huge hammering machine pounded the casing slowly into the ground. 
Then the earth drilling machine would be inserted into the casing. Its turning corkscrew drill would dig deep into the earth, pulling up more dirt, making it easier for the pile driver to slam the casing deeper. The operation went on and on. The news of the rescue attempt was picked up by the wire services and transmitted to major cities all over the country. It became an international incident. Switchboards at newspaper offices and radio stations all over the country were jammed with calls from the moment the child's plight became known. This was one of the first times that a television station cut into the film it was broadcasting, canceled it, and went to the scene of a breaking news story. Thousands turned their sets on and became involved for more than 27 hours as the dramatic fight to save Kathy progressed. The casing hit an underground rock formation. The volunteer with a small pick chipped away at the boulders. The casing could not be lowered farther until the rocks were removed. Now two men stood atop the casing, which was sticking about 15 feet above the ground. Buckets of rocks and dirt were being hauled up and dumped on the surface. The two men caught the buckets, grabbed them, and emptied them, and then sent them back down for more. Klaus Landsberg agreed to drop a microphone on a cable into the opening so the volunteers on top could hear the men working below. It also gave our viewers a powerful narration of what was happening at every moment. Bill Yancey often sang in an off-key voice to keep his spirits up while he tried to break through the layers of rock that halted the pounding of the casing into the ground. Herb Harpel was the next sand hog to go below. He was slowly lowered and took over the tough job that Yancey had begun. I heard Harpel shouting from the casing, I've hit water. It's seeping in on all sides. Pull me up. What had been routine for several hours suddenly became very tense. Could the water pour in so fast that it could trap Herb? There was much scurrying and shouting around the top of the casing as the bucket is slowly pulled up. That's far enough, shouted the voice on the microphone. Let me check this water level. I think this will be all right. It's just oozing in, plenty of mud. But we'll just have to haul it out. Herb's voice was almost casual now. Throughout the night, the sloppy mud was hauled up in the same bucket that carried the earth and broken rocks earlier. When Herb Harple was brought up, Tommy Francis took his turn at the back-breaking job. Next, it was O.A. Kelly's turn to go back down. Whitey Blickensdurfer followed the others. He had to be pulled up right after being lowered. The mud and water level was rising too fast. He held a brief meeting at the top, then descended deep into the tube again. As Sunday morning dawned, the mud was largely scraped away and they were able to go deeper into the ground. By early morning, the sand hogs had dug a small tunnel below the casing. Lumber was being sent down in the bucket. The men below were shoring up the vertical tunnel. They were digging across to the well shaft where Kathy was imprisoned. The bright April morning grew into a hot, sticky afternoon as the rescuers continued their long hours at the bottom. By late Sunday afternoon, the sand hogs built their tunnel to the well where Kathy was trapped. They spent hours strengthening the shaft where they were working, and they were cutting into the well pipe. About six o'clock, the microphone in the casing was turned off. It quickened fears that things turned for the worse. Mr. Fiscus had just returned from testifying at hearings in Sacramento about legislation that would require the cementing and covering of all open wells. He was an official of a water company, the same one that had sunk this water well over 40 years before. As darkness covered the scene, Dr. Robert McCulloch, the family physician, was strapped into a parachute harness. His face was grim as he lowered down to the crews working on the bottom. He was down there for only minutes, then pulled back up to the surface. An interesting aside, we never interviewed the Fiscus family. We knew they were there. We could see them there. And when it was over, uh, Sheriff Biskulus asked Bill Welch if he would mind going to the house and telling the Fiscus family the little Kathy had died. And it seems that they had been watching intermittently, and, they, and the sheriff felt this would be the best way to handle it. So Bill went up there and told them that Kathy wasn't coming home. But it's interesting, looking at it from our juncture in time, 
Klaus told me over my earphone that there was going to be an important announcement next to the rescue site. A small crowd of solemn-faced rescue workers walked toward the camera. In the middle of the cluster of men was another family physician, Dr. A. Hansen. He spoke to the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, Kathy is dead and has been dead for a long time. The family wishes to thank you, one and all, for your heroic efforts to try to save our child. Tired, dirty, beaten men cried. Rescuers stood silently, head bowed, unwilling to accept the news. The crowd of thousands was stunned. Viewers at home felt the pain of sorrow. Bill and I had been on the air for 27 and a half hours of continuous broadcasting. Viewers watched the entire drama unfold. The only solace was the fact that she probably died shortly after she fell into the well and did not suffer long in her prison. Historians agree that the Kathy Fiscus telecast marked the start of the long form of television news coverage. It has long been recognized as the first important news event of the commercial television era. So it was the next day when the phone started to ring and when the reaction started coming in that, uh, that we realized that we had really been through something that we had no idea we were doing that. And the interesting thing, it, uh, it changed my personal life as well as my, my business life because after that I wasn't just a guy on television, I was a, a news reporter, which was an interesting thing that I was thoroughly enjoying. And then uh, a couple of days afterwards, I got a call from a, a girlfriend that I had known at SC asking me over to, uh, to dinner. She wanted to meet her sister. So I went over and met her sister, and uh, Beverly and I were married three months later, three weeks later, five weeks we were, we were married. So it changed my personal life completely. And uh, so we were married for uh, 40 years, had 11 children, and all centered around the station, going to work, uh, this house here was just, just down the street, so it was a very, very wonderful, wonderful marriage, and we were so lucky to have 11 great children. Beverly and I met the following week. It was one of those meetings that you can't describe. Everything was perfect. They talk of love at first sight, but I never believed it was possible. How could two strangers know they were made for each other? There never was a doubt in my mind. Beverly's quiet, regal quality was captivating. Her face had a beautiful glow. Her eyes seemed to be always smiling. She had the softest, most delightful voice I had ever heard. From the very start, we were comfortable with each other, and we wanted to be together. We went out every night after I finished working at the station. We decided just a few weeks after we met that we should get married right away. We were a couple at love, and stayed that way until she died on February 4th, 1989. It didn't take long for competitors to catch on. And they would cover breaking stories just like we did. The other stations eventually, but not in the early years. So we were always trying to beat each other. And when we moved up here, their front gate entered onto Van Ness right in front of our front gate. So we could always tell when they were leaving with their mobile equipment. KTTV just left with them. <laughs> Quick, what is it? <laughs> so it was really fun. But, uh, it was that heavy competition that forced Stan and other news professionals to meet the daily challenges of TV news. Yeah, AJ-10, I'm ready to set up your signal to Mount Wilson for uh, Stan's live shot. Right you are, Jim, thank you. So that tremendous exhilaration of trying to get together, get all of your gear, get out there, clear, find Ken, out who's, who's in charge, who's talking, look at the fire, right? and then and once you, you get there Fine, and you see how you. big it is, well, your story's pretty well over then. You're not, you, here is a big building on fire. Now it's <coughs> your other resource of uh, how did it happen? Who's in there? Anyone injured? What should we do? Oh, fine, Sarge. Stan oh, Chambers, just fine. Good nice to see, to see you. you. Well, feeling good. We're, oh dear, was this uh, just lost control or was that? No, it appears as though 
He was coming around this corner. Uh -huh. He's uh, under the influence and drifted. And it just smacked the rear of the truck. Well, what, and, what I uh, would, would do driver, is the old who, what, why, okay. where, when. Uh, that helped a lot because who was here and who, who is he and what, what happened to him and why did it happen and where was he and, and when did it happen. In other words, that, those little phrases give you a capsule of what you have to know. Hi. Nice you. Good. Did you see what happened at all? We heard what happened. We heard. Basically, what did you hear? Fell in the blue car was coming through the intersection. Uh -huh. You, you don't give, give the stats. You give the story. What can you tell us at this point? If you look at a news story that seems complex, many a time I'll say to myself, well, not just what is the story? Why is this important? And uh, you kind of lead yourself into, into what you're going to say. The took place just across the street from Sepulveda Junior High School. The victim was taken to Holy Cross Hospital for further treatment. From Sepulveda, Stan Chambers, Channel we, 5 News. We, we try to get the most... Uh, the most visual thing we can in covering the story. I set up a sobriety checkpoint in the city of Paramount. Let's go to Stan Al, we're right on Rosecrans, right here at Paramount High School. Uh, all the cars that are going eastbound on Rosecrans have been funneled down to a single lane. And as they come by here, the deputies either wave them through or stop them. Uh, the the uh, checkpoint, uh, they take an observation. When you're live, it's a different thing because so you, you don't have the, the ability to put are, all the niceties uh, in. Are going on through, because you don't the have the ability, this, uh, as you would back at the station, sometime, to take the same story right now, and edit right it, it, putting the scenes that are the most visual together. So that's the big difference there. And then you write a script. You don't have a script on the first thing. <laughs> Here's what happened. I was standing here. The governor was over here. These people came into a room here. So <laughs> I think you hit it when you said storytelling. News is really the telling of the story. Track for the uh, intersection shooting. Five, four, three, Late this afternoon, a gunman in a car fired several shots into this blue Monte Carlo. Now, when you look back on something, <clears throat> why didn't I do it differently? There's a lot of that, a lot of second guessing. Uh, I didn't, I could have done better. I could have. So you do a lot of uh, uh, second guessing on yourself. You don't talk much about that to other people. And to follow along with your wife, She's a wonderful sounding board. You're able to talk to her and say, you'll never guess what happened. I had to do this, but you know. So <laughs> when, you, when you go home with this feeling of victory, uh, she's the audience you share it with, and she's the one that uh, lets you be, get that feeling of accomplishment, of satisfaction, of challenge, of I wonder what's gonna happen tomorrow. It is an accomplishment to survive the very fast-paced world of TV news. And Stan Chambers has met that goal now for over 60 years. This is an emotional moment, one I never thought I would ever make, because I am just went into television news. I love television news. I love everything about it. And I've loved it every day for the past uh, quarter century. So it's been wonderful. And then you wonder, well, you're uh, years old. <laughs> How long are you going to do this? Why don't you try something new? So I wrestled that for a while and disagreed, disagreed. But if I listened to myself, I would still be on the front lines but I realize that uh, there's a time for everything, and as much as I hate to say it, a time to retire. So to be here with all of you, and to watch the smiles on your face, to think of the memories that I'm able to recharge in you, of the history of Los Angeles that I've been a part of for so long, and that you personally experienced, and to be there when the first live cameras brought news into the home at the moment, an instant, is a very emotional thing. 
and then to be out covering news stories and bumping into people every day who remember this story, remember that story, remember the world. And I realized what a wonderful position I had all of those years. I was a part of that history. I was a part of that growth of Los Angeles. And it's a very exhilarating feeling. And so uh, I figure, well, in every, every game, there's the 10 second clock ticking away. I might as well retire and keep those 10 seconds to myself. And Gigi and I can go a few places that we've been planning to go for a long time. But there is no job in the world that's more satisfying than what we do every single day. You start with nothing. You hope to put a few things together to get something, to shoot it, to edit it, to put it on the air and say, Channel 5, News at 10. So really, it's going to be very difficult for me. But I'm quite sure we will keep our channels open and there will be some stories that Stan Chambers could do a good job on. I'll get a phone call and I'll be back in Main Street again. <laughs> so that's always over my shoulder, the, the numbers in the phone book under S. Chambers. <laughs> but thank all of you for being here. Um, we've been part of the L.A. history. And the city has changed so much, for good and for bad. But we've been there when it happened. And I think that's the satisfying thing. We live in the greatest place in the whole world, sunny California. We have everything going on. We're covering this and covering that. And we've been a part of it. But I think um, at a moment, look, you can't do this for 30 or 40 more years. Why don't you and Gigi get some plane tickets and fly around the world? <laughs> Thank you, darling. And I do want to thank all of you for being here. It's a big emotional thing for me. So pleased with the years that have gone by, looking ahead to the years that will be. I think all in all, I'm making the right decision. It's so great to have all of my friends here with me to make that right decision. So, the last time, Stan Chambers, Channel 5, News at 10.